Buenas noches. Me permitiré leer, leer, leer la semblanza del doctor Kramer. Stephen L. Kramer desarrolló sus estudios de ingeniería civil, así como los de maestría y doctorado en el área de ingeniería geotécnica en la Universidad de California en Berkeley, en los años 1977, 1979 y 1985 respectivamente. Incursionó en la ingeniería siendo ingeniero auxiliar para la firma Sargent and Lundy Engineers en la ciudad de Chicago, Illinois, en 1977. Posteriormente fue ingeniero de campo para la compañía Harding Lawson Associates en Novato, California, en 1979. Entre 1979 y 1982 fue ingeniero de proyecto para la compañía Cooper Clark en Redwood City, California. Al mismo tiempo fue asistente de investigador y asistente de profesor en la Universidad de California en Berkeley en 1977 y 1984. Fue también asistente de profesor y profesor asociado en el Departamento de Ingeniería Civil de la Universidad de Washington de 1984 a 1997, donde formó el Grupo de Geotecnia. Fue investigador científico senior en el Instituto Geotécnico Noruego, el NGI, en el año 2003. Desde 1997 y hasta la actualidad, es profesor titular de la Universidad de Washington y es también miembro desde, desde el año 2007 de la Facultad de Centro de Entrenamiento de Posgrado e Investigación en Ingeniería Sísmica en Ingeniería Sismológica de la Universidad de Pavia en Italia. El profesor Kramer tiene más de 100 publicaciones como autor y coautor, incluyendo 34 artículos destacados en revistas arbitradas internacionales, además de 40 publicaciones en congresos locales e internacionales. Entre los temas que ha desarrollado destacan la licuación de suelos, el comportamiento dinámico de pilotes, la interacción suelo estructura y el comportamiento sísmico de laderas. Es autor del internacionalmente conocido Geotechnical Airquake Engineering, publicado en 1996, donde se compilan por primera vez los principios básicos, teorías y métodos de la ingeniería geotécnica sísmica. Es autor del capítulo 33, Geotechnical Airquake Considerations, del manual de ingeniería sísmica publicado en 1993 y en 2003. Autor también del capítulo 4, Geotechnical Aspects of Seismic Hazards, del libro Airquake Engineering from Engineering Seismology to Performance Based Engineering. También autor de los conceptos de licuación y desplazamiento lateral en la enciclopedia de peligros naturales. Es autor de otras publicaciones con fines académicos como el movimiento inducido por sismos y revelación sísmica de cimentaciones existentes, así como el de ingeniería sísmica y dinámica de suelos, ambos publicados por la ASC. Stephen Kramer ha desarrollado 56 investigaciones patrocinadas por universidades, centros de investigación y dependencias gubernamentales en la Unión Americana, así como para instituciones y empresas privadas internacionales. Ha sido invitado a impartir 62 conferencias y seminarios en universidades, asociaciones e instituciones de investigación en los Estados Unidos y en el mundo. Las más recientes, relacionadas con los temas la ingeniería geotécnica sísmica basada por desempeño y la resistencia residual de suelos sujetos a la ecuación. Es miembro de la Asociación Americana de Ingeniería Civil, de la Sociedad Internacional de Mecánica de Suelos e Ingeniería Geotécnica, de la Sociedad Nacional de Estados Unidos, de la Sociedad Sismológica de América, de la Sociedad Internacional de Compañías de la Práctica en las Geociencias, del Consejo de Universidades de Investigación de Ingeniería Geotécnica y el Instituto de Investigación de Ingeniería Sísmica en la Unión Americana. Stephen Kramer es revisor de las revistas Geotechnical Testing Journal, Transportation Research Record y Journal of Geotechnical Engineering. También es revisor de las propuestas de investigación para la Fundación Nacional de Ciencias, del Servicio Geológico y de otras agencias de la Unión Americana. Entre los reconocimientos más destacados a que ha sido merecedor el profesor Kramer se tienen el Research Initiation Award en 1985, el Presidential Young Investigator en 1988, ambos de la Fundación Nacional de Ciencias, el Arthur Casagrande Profession Development de la ASC en 1991, el Walter Hoover Research Prize también de la ASC en 1996, el John R. Healy Professorship de la Universidad de Washington en 1997, es y por primera vez dos veces portador de la medalla Norman en el año 2009 y 2017 
y hace unos meses le fue entregada la medalla, la medalla Walton Seed, todas ellas por parte de la ASC. Eh, destaco que fue el profesor Walton Seed, su asesor de su trabajo de doctorado en la Universidad de California en Berkeley. En la Universidad de Washington ha impartido los cursos de mecánica de suelos básica, ingeniería sísmica y sismológica, diseño de cimentaciones, ingeniería geotécnica avanzada 1, estabilidad de laderas y resistencia al corte, diseño avanzado de cimentaciones, así como eh, dinámica de suelos e ingeniería geotécnica sísmica. También ha impartido cursos cortos y talleres de diseño sísmico de estructuras, análisis de respuesta sísmica, análisis de peligro sísmico, geodinámica, ingeniería de geotécnica sísmica, entre otros. El profesor Kramer ha sido, autor de 12, ha sido tutor de 12 estudiantes de doctorado, eh, 46 de maestría y miembro de más de 70, 70 comités asesores a estudiantes de posgrado. Ha sido consultor de empresas privadas y dependencias gubernamentales, principalmente en Washington, además de algunas en el resto de la Unión Americana y en otros países. Por más de una década, Kramer ha sido uno de los líderes del Centro de Investigación de Ingeniería Sísmica del Pacífico, el PIR, y también ha contribuido significativamente al desarrollo de la ingeniería geotécnica en los temas de licuación, estabilidad sísmica de laderas y comportamiento dinámico de los suelos. Sus actuales investigaciones están dirigidas a la ingeniería sísmica por desempeño, particularmente la integración de los análisis de respuesta y peligro sísmico probabilistas. Por su destacada trayectoria profesional, el profesor Stephen L. Kramer ha sido invitado por nuestra Sociedad Mexicana de Ingeniería Geotécnica a impartir la conferencia Nabor Carrillo Flores en el marco de esta vigésima novena Reunión Nacional de Ingeniería Geotécnica. Profesor Kramer, welcome to our society. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I think it's the longest introduction I've ever been given. <laughs> But I appreciate it, and I would like to thank the, the Mexican Society and the organizers of the conference for inviting me to give this prestigious lecture uh, for all of the arrangements they've made to, uh, to make my short visit here very comfortable. So thank you all very much. I'd like to speak today about performance-based design in geotechnical earthquake engineering practice. Um, it's a topic that I've spent a good deal of my, my time researching over the last uh, several years, and so I'd like to give an, an overview of it and uh, see how it can, can be used to help us do better designs. There we go. I'd like to first acknowledge couple of agencies that have provided funding to support my research in this area, the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center, the Air Center, and the Washington State Department of Transportation. I'd also like to acknowledge some of my co-workers, um, my good friend and colleague, Professor Pedro Arduino, and graduate students, Roy Mayfield, Young Sun Shin, Kevin Frankie, Yiman Wong, Sam Sedaris, Mike Greenfield, and Andrew McDesey all worked on topics related to performance-based design. In this presentation, after a brief introduction, we'll talk about geotechnical design in general and then seismic design, we're talking about historical approaches and code-based approaches, and that will serve as an introduction to performance-based design. And there are different ways of implementing performance-based design, so we'll talk about the different levels at which it can be implemented. And we'll talk about some procedures where we may advance our abilities to, to design within this performance-based framework. Um, and I'll end with, uh, with an example and then some summary and conclusions and hopefully finish before the buses leave for dinner. So the design process in general involves defining some objectives that we would like our design to satisfy in terms of its performance. We then characterize the loading that we anticipate our system to be uh, subjected to. We select an approach to design. We develop a preliminary design. 
and then we analyze that design by some method. It may be a relatively simple method or it may be a complicated method. And after that analysis, we determine whether or not our performance objectives have been met. If they haven't, then we have to alter our design or revise it. And we reanalyze the revised design and we continue looming through that process until we've met our performance objectives and then we can move on to construction. If we look at performance objectives, we should take some time to think about what we mean by performance. Because there's many different ways in which we can describe performance and different people involved in seismic design describe it in different ways. We can talk about demands exceeding capacities, which we have done for many years, where we express both demands and capacities in terms of forces or stresses. And when we do that, we compare them by means of a factor of safety. But we have to recognize that it can be difficult to predict the demands, the forces that will be induced in a structure, particularly under earthquake shaking conditions. It's also difficult to know what the capacities are. So there are uncertainties in both of these. And we consider those uncertainties and the consequences of failure when we determine some minimum allowable factor of safety for design. But we could also look at performance in terms of deformations. It could be settlements, could be lateral movements, could be rocking types of deformations. And they're difficult to predict, even more difficult to predict accurately than forces are. It's also difficult to know exactly what our deformation capacities are, how much movement can occur before damage is, uh, is caused. And so we use, take account of those uncertainties and the consequences of failure to determine the maximum allowable deformations. We could look at performance in terms of physical damage. It could be cracking of a floor slab, spalling of concrete from a column, hinging of a pile, all could be measures, suitable measures of performance. We could have catastrophic performance, collapse. It's difficult to characterize physical damage in many cases, and it's difficult to predict. So we have uncertainties there as well. Or we could take this all the way to losses. It could consider the repair cost of a building or a bridge after an earthquake has occurred. We could consider the losses that are associated with downtime, the fact that that building or bridge can't be used for some period of time. We can look at law casualties, injuries, and deaths, again, as, as extreme examples of casualties. So in earthquake engineering, in geotechnical earthquake engineering, We've been doing analyses for almost 100 years. Retaining walls were addressed by Mononobi and Okabe back in 1926 and 1929, and they used a pseudostatic approach where we represented the complex dynamic effects of an earthquake by static forces, equivalent static forces. And there's some resistance that the soil provides to that, but we calculate the factor of safety on the basis of these forces. We do similar things for slope stability analysis. We can perform pseudostatic for slope stability analyses. For foundations, we perform pseudostatic types of analyses, and these were the standards for many years. We've advanced beyond the force-based approach to looking at deformations and displacements. So we use things like a Newmark sliding block analysis to predict instead of a factor of safety against slope failure, we estimate the amount of movement that the slope will take under observed under earthquake conditions. A number of investigators have used those analyses and developed kind of simplified charts like those of McDesey and C uh, some 40 years ago. Travisaro and Bray used many more slopes and many more earthquake motions and much faster computers to develop similar approaches and Rath, G, and Seidley have used thousands of ground motions in many different slope conditions and have been able to characterize them, not just the immediate response, but also the uncertainty in sliding block predictions. We can do more advanced analyses, finite element analyses, to predict slope deformations. 
We can use those types of analyses for foundations as well. Shallow foundations or deep foundations with suitable interface elements and other factors that, that uh, are required to address those kinds of problems. We can simplify those a bit and use macro elements for shallow foundations or for deep foundations. The early building codes that attempted to formalize uh, seismic design were intended for structures to resist minor shaking without any damage, moderately strong shaking without structural damage, but perhaps some non-structural damage, and very strong levels of shaking without collapsing. And so they specify different levels of seismic loading, different strengths of the ground motions, and different levels of performance for each of those levels of shaking. In the mid-1990s, in the Western US, the Vision 2000 document was developed to advance for the first time or to formalize performance-based seismic design. And it, based, it was based on four levels of ground motion with different performance objectives for each of those. So those levels of ground motion were based on ground motion return periods. So frequent motions were those that would occur on average every 43 years. Occasional, rare, and very rare ground motions would occur less frequently. There were four objectives, four levels of performance, fully operational, operational, life safe, and near collapse. Some of these combinations were considered to be unacceptable. We wouldn't want to have structures that are near collapse and frequently occurring ground motions. For typical structures, the intention was that they be designed to be fully operational in frequent earthquakes, following frequent earthquakes, to be operational following occasional earthquakes, to be life safe in rare ground motions, and to be near collapse or to avoid collapse in very rare motions. More important structures, more critical structures like police and fire stations, hospitals, emergency response uh, centers were held to a higher standard and critical structures like nuclear power plants or toxic waste facilities uh, were held to higher standards yet. If we look at the process that leads to losses to performance, it begin with earthquake ground motions. There are many different ways we can describe ground motions. That causes some system, whether it's a building or a bridge or a dam or a slope, to respond dynamically. If that response is excessive, we incur physical damage, and that damage leads to losses. The losses result from physical damage. The physical damage results from strong levels of system response, and that response is caused by ground motions. Usually, in seismic design, in seismic evaluation, we start on the left side. We start with the ground motions and we use some type of response model to predict how our system is going to respond. It might be a very simple empirical model, it might be something we do on a spreadsheet, or it might be a three-dimensional, non-linear, effective stress finite element analysis, but it is intended to predict the response of our system to seismic loading. We can then take that response and use it to predict damage. It could be cracking of, of beams, columns or some other measure of physical damage. And we can use a loss model to convert that damage into losses. So we need some terminology to describe these quantities. So I'm going to use the terminology of the, of the peer center where we'll describe ground motions by intensity measures, our response by engineering demand parameters, damage by damage measures, and losses by decision variables. So I'll use these symbols in the rest of the, of the presentation. With this kind of a framework, then our response model is intended to produce an estimate of the response or the EDP given some level of shaking or given some intensity measure, IM. Our damage model is going to predict the damage measure given the EDP 
and our loss model is going to predict the decision variable given the damage measure. All of these things we have to recognize are uncertain. The variables are uncertain and the models that produce those variables are uncertain. And we need to account for that uncertainty if we're going to develop a robust, consistent, objective design procedure. So there's uncertainty in the ground motions and they're different in Mexico City than they are here or in other places in Mexico. They're different, very different across the United States. There's uncertainty in the way sites respond from one location to another. We have to account for that. There's uncertainty in the damage that's produced for different types of structures or even similar types of structures designed differently will have different levels of damage. There's uncertainty in losses. The cost of repairing a building may be different here than it is in Mexico City or than it is in Cancun or another city. There's differences in losses associated with time. Inflation can occur, interest rates can change, there are all many things that can change and cause losses to be different over time. If we ignore these uncertainties, or we assume that the uncertainties are the same everywhere, we're going to end up with inaccurate predictions of performance for different structures at different locations. We'll have inconsistent levels of safety from one project to another. And we'll have, consequently, inefficient use of the resources, of the money we have, to retrofit existing structures or design new structures. And so the performance-based approach that I'll describe can, can account for these uncertainties and eliminate these kinds of problems. There are different ways that we can do this. We can illustrate it in a simple sense by looking at a, dis a discretized system. If we, my font is off there. If we look at an earthquake, uh, an earthquake <laughs> occurring, Let's imagine that it can only produce five different levels of shaking, IM1 through IM5, okay? We can think of these as five ranges of shaking, perhaps. And each of those can produce five levels of response. So let's say our, our level of shaking is IM2. There are five EDPs that can be produced by that, EDP1 through EDP5. Let's imagine that we have EDP4. Then if we assume there are five levels of damage that can occur, and there are sustained PM3, and five levels of loss that can be caused by that damage, perhaps DM5 is our level of loss. So we have one path through this network shown here. And if that was the only path from IM2 to DP4 to DM3 to DP5, our loss would be DP5. But we have to account for the fact that there's some probability that the intensity measure, given that an earthquake occurred, was IM2 and not one of the others. There's a probability that our EDP was EDP4, given that the IM was IM2, a probability of DM3 given EDP4, and a probability that the damage variable is DP5, given that the damage measure was TV3. And so there would be a loss or cost associated with that one path. If we sum over all the paths, then we'll get the expected value of the loss that we have, or our average value of the loss. For this case, we have five choices for each of these. We have 625 paths. If we discretize it more finely, say with 100 for each, we have 100 million paths. So too many to, to deal with. So we can take a different approach, an integral hazard level approach. And this was developed by the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center. It's known as the PEER framework. And it takes the form of a triple integral which everybody likes to see triple integrals on Friday afternoon. <laughs> but it's not as complicated as it might look. The first part is the result of a probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. These are things we do very frequently. We account for 
the distribution of uh, earthquakes. We account for the earthquake sources, the faults that can cause strong shaking at our site. We look at how often those faults produce earthquakes of different magnitudes. We look at the geometry to produce, to estimate the distribution of source to site distances. We look at the uncertainty in the ground motions, we put them together, and our seismic hazard curve tells us how often we can expect to see different levels of shaking. The next term is the output of our response model. That is a probabilistic response model. And it's given in the form of a fragility curve that tells us the probability of exceeding a given level of response for a given intensity measure. And so our probabilistic response model will give us a family of fragility curves. The next term is represented by a family of fragility curves that describe the damage. So it's the result of our damage model. And we have another set of fragility curves that describe the probabilities of different levels of loss. And the integration process is really just summing these up. And when we do that, we end up with a loss curve that tells us the probabilities of having different levels of loss, which we could measure in terms of, say, a repair cost. And so this would tell us for a 1% probability, annual probability, we have expect a loss of about $2.7 million, perhaps. Every thousand years, or at, with a probability, an annual probability of 0.1%, we could have a loss of $5.8 million. And so this allows us to estimate what the, in financial terms, what the losses will be for a particular design. If we try a different design, we'll have a different loss curve, and we might find that our 1% probability has dropped down to 1.6 million, and our 0.1% probability to 3.9 million. So the reciprocal of those probabilities we refer to as a return period. Uh, so we'd have a 100-year return period of $1.6 million loss, and a 1,000-year return period of $3.9 million loss. So better performance, because our losses are lower. But it would cost us something to achieve that lower level of, of loss. We'd have to have a more, uh, a more robust structure, or maybe we would have to uh, improve the soils. But we could compare the extra cost of that alternative design with the benefit in terms of the reduced losses and make a decision about whether it's a good investment to do that uh, alternative design or not. This peer framework is, is very convenient because it's modular, so we can take a ground motion hazard curve and come up with a response hazard curve and use that with our response, our damage model to come up with a damage hazard curve and use that with our loss model to come up with a loss curve. So we can use these in intermediate uh, types of relationships as well. That loss curve accounts for all possible earthquake magnitudes, it accounts for all source to site distances, it accounts for the uncertainty in the ground motion for all of those combinations of magnitude and distance. It accounts for uncertainty in the response given the ground motion that has occurred. It accounts for uncertainty in the damage given the responses that we expect or could occur. It accounts for uncertainty in the losses given the different levels of damage. We're integrating now over all levels of shaking. So we're considering weak shaking that occurs frequently and very strong shaking that occurs only rarely. In typical current designs, we choose one return period for the ground motions, and we base our, ground, our design on that one period. Uh, and in this approach, we can do better than that. We're, all, we're accounting for response, damage, and loss, we're computing them explicitly, and we're considering the uncertainties in each of those. We can look at this process if we make some simplifying assumptions about our, our ground motion hazard curve, if we assume it's defined by a power law, and that our response model gives results that are defined by a power law. We can carry out the integration analytically and we get the expression that's shown here that gives us our expression for a 
response has occurred. And it has two parts. And the first part is based on the median behavior as a function of uncertainty in our ability to predict the response. And it acts like an amplifier because that term, when the standard deviation is zero, it has a value of one. And as the standard deviation increases, that value increases above one. And so it tends to amplify the response as a function of the uncertainty that we have. We can look at an example and fit a power law to, to data. This, this is a hazard curve uh, from the U.S. Geological Survey uh, in the San Francisco area. And if we fit a power law at least approximately to a uh, slope displacement relationship, we can combine these and look at the effects of uncertainty and see that the beta term represents the standard deviation of our response model. For different levels of uncertainty, we see higher and higher levels of response. Um, and if we go, say, to a, uh, a particular level of, of uh, a particular hazard level, and we compare the displacement of that slope that would occur if we assume we had no uncertainty, and that with an uncertainty, a standard deviation of, of one, logarithmic standard deviation of one, it doubles the, the displacement. So half of that displacement is associated with uncertainties. And so as geotechnical engineers, we can reduce the, that level of response by reducing uncertainties. If we take that same approach and extend it to damage and to loss and make the same basic assumptions, we get this expression, which the details are not important, but it has two parts also, one based on all the median relationships and one that's based on uncertainties. And there's uncertainty in the response model, uncertainty in the damage model, and uncertainty in the loss model here. And so if we look at a particular location and we assume that we have no uncertainty, our loss curve, this could be the value of dv, could be a repair cost, would, might look like this. If we add our response model uncertainty, that curve moves up and to the right. If we add the damage model uncertainty, it moves some more. And if we add the loss model uncertainty, it moves even more. And so for a given return period, our losses increase as the uncertainty increases. So we can get a big benefit, provide a big benefit as geotechnical engineers by reducing uncertainty. And that may involve um, performing more extensive subsurface investigations or doing more detailed analyses, but we can reduce the losses. And this kind of information can be very useful to explain to a client why it's advisable to invest in more subsurface investigation or detailed analyses. So reducing this uncertainty can help us reduce losses. We can implement performance-based design in different ways, and we can reduce uncertainties by being smarter about how we describe, for example, ground motions. We can talk about the efficiency of a ground motion parameter, which tells us how well that parameter just predicts response. Here are some results from one set of analyses where the displacements of the slope of a slope and a sliding block analysis are plotted versus different common ground motion intensity measures. For peak acceleration, the standard deviation of the, of the logarithm of the displacement is 1.3. For areas intensity, it's 0.94. For peak velocity squared, it's 1.1. And so the lowest standard deviation comes from Areas intensity. So for this particular case, which involves permanent displacements of shallow slides, areas intensity is the most efficient predictor of displacement. It has the least uncertainty. We also are concerned about sufficiency, that is how completely an intensity measure predicts response. If we look at residuals or, or deviations in our response and plot them versus other parameters, such as magnitude, we did this for liquefaction problems, which we normally solve using a peak acceleration. And if we use peak acceleration by itself, we tend to have a trend with respect to magnitude. And 
And so we over predict the pore water pressure in a liquefiable soil uh, at low magnitudes, and we under predict it systematically at large magnitudes. And so this gives rise to a correction that we call a magnitude scaling factor that's a common part of our, of our liquefaction analysis procedures. The predictability of an intensity measure is also important. We use ground motion prediction equations to estimate the uncertainty in ground motion models in various prediction of various ground motion parameters. So peak acceleration, peak ground velocity, spectral accelerations, they're all in a range of about 0.55 to 0.65 or so. Areas intensity, while well, it did well for predicting the displacements of slopes, shallow slopes, it's very difficult to predict. It has a very high level of uncertainty. Cumulative absolute velocity, another parameter that we can use, has a very low uncertainty. So it is uh, very highly predictable. If we look at the predictions that we would make uh, based on these uncertainties, for cumulative absolute velocity, our probability distribution looks like this, compared to area intensity, it looks like that. So there's big differences, and, we, and they make a difference in our final results. To get an idea of how much difference it might make, we could consider a site that's shown by the red dot here, next to a, near the end of a fault. Um, if we perform an analysis, a, um, We assume typical values for the predictability and typical values for the efficiency. That dark curve in the middle shows the, our, the values of our engineering demand parameter. If we assume that our predictability is 20% worse and our efficiency is 20% worse, the curve moves to the location given by the red curve, moves significantly up and to the right. If we assume we have better predictability but still 20% worse efficiency, things are a little bit better. If we assume we have worse predictability, but now better efficiency, our curve has dropped. And if we assume we have 20% better predictability and 20% better efficiency, then our curve has dropped even further. And so there's a strong benefit to using predictable intensity measures and efficient intensity measures. And in many of our analyses now, we don't do that. So there's room for improvement. For a given return period, we can see substantial differences in a predicted response. So if that response is the displacement of a slope or the interstory drift of a structure, by going from 20% worse to 20% better, our response is changed by about a factor of four. So these are things we can do to do a better job. The distributions for these look like this. So the green ones where we have better predictability, better efficiency, and the red is where both things are worse. So it makes a big difference. If we're going to implement performance-based design at the response level, then we're going to have to infer the level of damage because we're not computing it directly. And we have to infer the loss from our inferred damage. And so it's going to be a, a fuzzier quantity. We're not going to know it as well. It will be less accurate. The way we can do this, when we do it, we need to have a probabilistic response model that's going to tell us an uncertainty in the ground in the response given the ground motion. So this applies to, say, site response, where we may have a soil profile with some rock motion that's applied at the base of our profile, and we want to determine what the motion at the surface of the soil is. And so we can perform that by doing a series of amplification analyses. So if we have a rock hazard curve, we'd like to determine what the ground surface soil hazard curve would be. In order to do that, we need to define an amplification factor, and we need to define the uncertainty in that amplification factor. And so there are many different ways in which this can be done, in which it is done. We often rely on, on uh, site classification. We have a site category, and we assign some amplification 
into a given site category, or we may make it a function of something like VS30, the average shear wave velocity at upper 30, 30 meters. There's uncertainties associated with those. The um, gray zone here shows amplification factor uncertainty that we obtain from, uh, from empirical data, from actual ground motion recordings. The different curves are based on one-dimensional analyses, and the analyses are showing higher uncertainties at low periods and lower uncertainties at long periods. So we have some improvements that we can, we can make in our analytical procedures here. We can do probabilistic liquefaction analyses. Um, if we do that, we're going to take a probabilistic liquefaction model and combine it with our probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. And we develop procedures for doing this, and they give us a factor of safety hazard curves. So we can see how often the factor of safety will drop below a certain value. And they're shown here for five locations in the United States, ranging from very high seismicity to very low seismicity. And for an element of soil at a depth of six meters, we look at the uh, return periods for factors of safety of one, which correspond to the triggering of liquefaction, we can see that in San Jose, California, we expect that element of soil to liquefy every 50 years. And that considers all of the earthquakes and all the ground motions that could occur in San Jose. In Butte, Montana, where there's very little earthquake activity, that same element of soil they liquefy every 5,000 years. We can do similar types of analyses for lateral spreading at these different locations, considering all possible earthquakes, not just one return period or a small number of return periods. So every 1,000 years, uh, in Pima, Montana, we have a displacement that would exceed about 10 or 15 centimeters or so. Uh, but in Eureka, uh, uh, California, for postal liquefaction settlement, which one of my students did. Uh, initially, assuming that the soil was susceptible to liquefaction, that the liquefaction was going to be triggered, and not accounting for any maximum volumetric strain. When he accounted for a maximum volumetric strain, the curve shifted from the black region to the blue region. When he accounted for the fact that the soil might not, liquefaction might not be triggered, and lower levels of shaking, and we accounted for the fact that the soil might not be susceptible to liquefaction. These hazard curves change. We have the ability to do these things now. They've been done for soil instabilities. Uh, here's a peak acceleration hazard curve uh, developed by uh, Professor Albert Rathje, University of Texas, and her students. And the corresponding soil displacement hazard curve is shown in blue for a model that predicts displacement as a function of peak acceleration and earthquake magnitude. The red curve shows a peak ground velocity hazard curve. And she and her student slightly developed a, uh, a vector-based uh, displacement prediction model that was based on both peak acceleration and peak velocity. And that's shown by the kind of combined red and blue curve on the left. And it's cut the displacement about in half by reducing the uncertainty, making more accurate measurements of the or predictions of the slope displacement. If we look at these sliding water models, many people have done these types of analyses to characterize the uncertainty. Based on just peak acceleration and magnitude, we have an uncertainty, a logarithmic uncertainty, over 1.0. acceleration and peak velocity together reduces that uncertainty substantially. And accounting for the flexibility of the soil above the failure surface can reduce it even more. So we have these abilities now to, to uh, develop and improve probabilistic response models. And we can use them in this type of framework. So those are techniques we can use for response level implementation which is the most common way that performance-based design is done now, at least in the United States. But we can go beyond that and try to characterize performance in terms of damage measures. If we do that, now we're going to explicitly calculate our ground motions on response.
loss and our damage, and we'll just have to infer the losses from the damage. But it means we need to have allowable levels of damage. So we need a damage model that needs to be a probabilistic damage model. How much settlement does it take to crack a concrete slab? That's not a, an easy problem for us to solve in many cases. Um, so there's uncertainty associated with that. How much lateral movement is required to cause yielding or hinging of a pile? If it's a concrete pile, how about if it's a steel pile? What are the hinge lengths? There are many uh, important problems that we need to, to be able to understand in terms of the capacity of our systems to, to resist high levels of response. So we can attempt to do this with continuous damage scales. It's a fragility curve approach. But some damage states uh, are not continuous. If we look at collapse, the structure either collapses or it doesn't collapse. It's not a, it's not a uh, continuous system. Uh, and we don't have much data for, for other types of damage levels. So it's much more common to use a discrete damage measure approach or we develop a damage probability matrix that shows us what levels of damage we can expect to occur for different levels of response. And so we might have one element here, X42, that would represent the probability that our, our response in EDP interval 2 would produce a damage in damage measure, in, in damage measure 4, severe damage. So we can populate this uh, matrix with a bunch of probabilities. And people have done that. Christian Ledesma, John Bray did that for a bridge that's underlain by liquefiable soil. And he looked at two different uh, probability levels, hazard levels, and they had five damage states, no damage, small, moderate, large damage, or collapse. And they looked at the probabilities of being in each of these damage states for the weak motion, the frequent motion, with 82% probability in 50 years. There was no probability of being outside of the no damage area, so they predicted no damage at all. But for stronger shaking, 2% probability in a 50 year period, which would be a return period of almost 2,500 years, they had. Probabilities, significant probabilities of being in medium or large levels of damage. We can go on and do loss level implementations. Uh, this is UMI after the COVID earthquake. We began working on this problem and he looked at repair of a caisson key wall at a port using life cycle cost now as his measure of loss. And so he looked at five different options for repairing a damaged key wall. Um, and then used that as part of a, a design approach. And he found that uh, grouting the foundation, which he referred to as foundation cementation, had the lowest life cycle cost. The construction costs were all about the same. And the direct losses were not greatly different, but the indirect losses were much lower for that particular case. And so because it could be constructed faster, it had the lowest overall life cycle cost. Go to Hata, also from Japan, looked at widening of an expressway embankment and looked at a bunch of different potential approaches. The conventional design that was done initially had a relatively low cost of 1.4 billion yen. I don't how much maybe Rome would be able to convert that faster than, than I can. Um, it had a relatively low initial cost, but it had a relatively high life cycle cost. What they found was that a five meter widening with deep mixing, deep soil mixing, would have a higher initial cost, but overall, in the long term, its life cycle cost would be about half of what the uh, conventional design would have given. We did analyses of a bridge underlain by liquefiable soils. We did some very rigorous analyses using uh, fine element analyses and came up with loss curves of repair cost, which we expressed as a 
repair cost ratio, ratio of the repair cost to the replacement value of the bridge. And we found for the case where that, that bridge was undermined by electrifiable soils, we had losses that looked like this. It doesn't include losses due to downtime, and it doesn't occur losses due to casualties, so it's only repair costs. But for a 100-year return period, the losses were about 16% of the replacement cost of the bridge. At a 1,000-year return period, 47%. We then assumed that soil improvement had been undertaken to eliminate the possibility of liquefaction. And we repeated the analysis for that case. We found that our loss curve looked like this. So now the 100-year loss dropped to 5%, and the 1,000-year loss dropped to 20%. And so you can use those numbers to calculate a present value of those losses. And you can compare that with the cost of doing a soil improvement that would be required to prevent liquefaction from occurring. And you can determine whether or not that's a good investment. Another benefit of this approach is we can de-aggregate. And so with our analysis, we can go back and see what was responsible for those losses at different return periods. Simply showing here values for the 475 year return period of the losses. And it was mostly associated with providing temporary support for the abutment and putting new miles in. We can advance our, our abilities in this area by improving our way in which we can describe the capacities and when we know the capacities of our, of our structures. How do we get to characterize physical damage? How much movement can different types of structures tolerate? Some people have, have looked at this. Uh, Julia Bird looked at reinforced concrete frames that were found on top of the cloud soils where the foundations moved. She defined four different damage states uh, and gave good, pretty clear descriptions of the damage states. Airline cracks for the slight damage, crack widths of a millimeter, can constitute moderate damage, fly flexural shear cracks were extensive damage, and the building is so damaged that it can't be repaired, uh, at least economically, for complete damage. And so she defined limit states that separate these different damage states, and performed analyses that came up with fertility curves for both horizontal ground movement and vertical ground movement. So these fertility curves tell you the probabilities of being in each of these damage states or at the boundaries between the damage states as a function of the either horizontal or vertical displacement. So we can see the amounts of displacement that are required to produce those different damage states. Now, the slope of the fragility curve is a measure of the uncertainty. And so we can see there's a higher uncertainty for vertical development than there is for horizontal movement because those curves are flatter. We can characterize uncertainty and account for that in our models. If we go back and look at the hazard curve for a uh, for response level, the equation would look like this. If we add in capacity and account for the uncertainty of capacity, and integrate over the entire distribution of capacity, we can come up with an expression that looks like this one at the bottom. It has an extra term relative to what we had before, and it's a capacity uncertainty amplifier. And so there's another amplifier that accounts for uncertainty in our capacity. The fact that we don't necessarily know exactly how much displacement is required to cause a given level of damage. And that has an effect on our curves as well. And so as we increase the uncertainty in our capacity, our displacements increase, or our loss, our damage levels increase. So it's important to be able to characterize capacity and uncertainty in capacity. And we do that now in a very uh, informal, simplified way. So for young people, when you're, when you're tired of winning laptops, on and, and uh, start solving some of these problems for us.
Um, it's common in, in, in the design of highway structures, at least in the U.S., to use load and resistance factor design. Um, so kind of partial factors of safety that we apply to the loading and that we apply to the resistance. It's possible also to take these performance-based concepts and put them in that type of a framework. And if we can do that, then we can account for a lot of the benefits that the performance-based procedures give us uh, without requiring practicing engineers to do things differently. We simply have different load and resistance factors to use. So we need to deal with this capacity problem here. If we look at a, you know, a particular limit state, um, which we can describe in terms of forces by a, a load measure, if we assume we had no uncertainty and we make the assumption that we have uh, this kind of idealized uh, power law relationships, our load measure with no uncertainty would look like this. If we accounted for uncertainty in the loading, then the curve is going to move to the right. And if we account for uncertainty in the loading and the capacity, it's going to move even more to the right. If we look at a particular return period for that limit state, we can have define a load measure LM0 that corresponds to no uncertainty. For that return period, the load measure that accounts for uncertainty in loading only could be LM sub L, and the one that accounts for uncertainty in loading and the capacity could be LM sub LC. If we take those equations that I showed previously and solve them for the load measures, we have an expression for LM0 different expression for LM sub L and a different expression yet for LM sub LC. So this is just a little bit of algebra to, to solve these equations. Our value of LM sub LC then we can write as LM0, the value with no uncertainty, multiplied by two ratios. And we can rearrange these so that if our return, if our median capacity is going to be exceeded every at a certain return period, that will occur when our median capacity, C with a hat, multiplied by the ratio of LML to LMLC is equal to our median loading multiplied by the ratio of LM sub L to LM zero. Or if V times our median capacity is equal to gamma times our median load. So phi is a, uh, or gamma is a load factor and C is a resistance factor in this analysis. And so we have now load factors and resistance factors which we can put in the typical LRFD design framework that are commonly used now that are computed for, from this uh, full performance based approach. So our closed form expressions for the load and resistance factors are shown here. And again, they're a function of the uncertainty in the loading and the uncertainty in the capacity. So these come directly into determining what these load and resistance factors are. And so if we have a high uncertainty in our, in our loading, we're going to have a high load factor. If we have a high uncertainty in our capacity, then we're going to have a low capacity factor or resistance factor. We can extend this from loads to displacements or deformations. If we do this for a foundation, we can think of our load variable or our load measure as having five components, a vertical load, horizontal loads in two directions, and overturning moments in two directions. We won't worry about torsion because we rarely, rarely have foundations that are subjected to torsion. We could have a, a response variable or a vector, uh, an EDP vector, that consists of three displacements, vertical and two horizontal, and two rotations. Well, we can carry out then a response analysis using an intermediate variable of our load measure. And so we'll account for the displacements of the load measure and the load measure given the ground motions. So if we make close-form assumptions of the type we did previously, 
our loads and moments are going to be represented by power laws, and our displacements and rotations also by power laws. We can come up with a closed form solution for our our response in terms of displacements. So it accounts for the uncertainty in the loads given the ground motion and the uncertainty in the deformations given the loads. If we add in the capacity, now we have an uncertainty in the capacity accounted for. And so we can do the same sort of thing, which I'll go through quickly. Um, we have a hazard curve, assume, a, a deformation hazard curve assuming no uncertainty. Another one assuming uncertainty in the loading and the response. And a third that accounts for also uncertainty in the capacity. And again, we can solve for values with no uncertainty, values for uncertainty in the load and resistance, and values where we have uncertainty in the load, resistance, and capacity. And go through the same process of uh, defining these ratios, and we can find that we can express things in terms of our median capacity multiplied by a ratio uh, being equal to a median demand multiplied by another ratio, and those ratios we can define as capacity factors and demand factors. So the capacity factor is analogous to the resistance factors that we use now, except we're looking at deformation capacities, not load capacities. And our loading is a our load our demand factor is analogous to a load factor, except it depends on it's a function of deformations and not loads. So we have a demand factor and a capacity factor, and we can do the equivalent of a load resistance factor design in terms of deformations using demand and capacity factors. And for our simplified uh, assumptions, we have closed form expressions for our uh, demand factor and capacity factor. We applied this to a five by five pile group in sand. We had five components of load, five components of displacement. They're all correlated to each other, so it became uh, a lot more complicated problem. The simplifying assumptions did not work, so we had to carry out these integrations numerically um, in five dimensions. So it turned out to be a quite a quite a complex problem. Uh, we had a foundation. We subjected it to to loading uh, to, to ground motions. We saw what the loads were given the input motions. We had a model of our foundation, a pile foundation with PY, TZ, QZ curves. We took those loads and applied it to the foundation and predicted what the deformations of the foundations would be. Our, our model allowed us to, to calculate vertical settlements and due to both static and cyclic loads. Some of the responses are shown here. Uh, we looked at many different conditions for sand profiles and clay profiles for different structural, uh, different structures on top of our, our pile foundation. Uh, we subjected it to uh, many different input motions, three components of input motion, and looked at the uncertainties in the deformations that we experienced for different pile groups and different configurations. And so we developed a relationship that would describe these deformations, characterize the uncertainties, and put them through this numerical integration process. We assumed that the uh, foundations were located in the San Francisco area and then also in the Seattle area. We calculated our load measure uh, hazard curves. So we can see LM0, LML, and LMC, LC and use those to calculate load and resistance factors. We did it for Seattle and for San Francisco. So our curves look like these. The load and resistance factors are all relatively close to one because uncertainties in predicting the forces are relatively small. So the LM hazard curves were pretty close to each other. We could also see that they varied with the return period as we go to more and more rare motions or stronger and stronger motions, the uncertainty increased. But still, our load and resistance factors here were relatively close to one. Then we did the same thing for deformations, where we had to account for the uncertainty in, in pile movements, uh, or foundation movements, relative to the, the loads that were applied to them. 
and here we saw much more deviation. So here we see the EDP uh, with no uncertainty curve on the left, on the left plot, uncertainty in the load and resistance, and uncertainty in load resistance and capacities. So to conclude, our seismic design, we've always considered performance, but we've done it in a pretty informal manner, um, not in a rigorous way. We can characterize performance in different ways. We, as engineers, tend to look at it in terms of response. How much is the slope going to move? How much is the foundation going to move? Uh, a, a contractor might look at it in terms of the damage that would have to be repaired. An owner would look at it in terms of the cost. All of those are, are valid ways of looking at performance. And different people look at performance in different ways. It's important that we define performance objectives in a clear, objective way and to consider this at the beginning of the project, not at the end. We can design for specified levels of performance, but we have to have, we have to properly consider the uncertainties in the process if we want to do it in a uniform and objective way. For a given return period, uncertainty is going to cause all these things response, damage, and loss to become higher. The geotechnical engineers can reduce losses, reduce response, using, by reducing uncertainties. And we can do that by doing more detailed subsurface investigations, more lab and field testing, more detailed and rigorous analyses. The use of performance-based concepts has increased quite a bit in the United States, particularly the Western United States, where most of our seismic hazards are, but it's being used now in the Eastern United States also because the conventional procedures penalize the Eastern United States uh, because of the different seismicity. So they get a big benefit there, even though their, their hazards are not as great. It's usually implemented at the response level by looking at displacements or deformations and comparing them to allowable deformations. We can take these performance-based concepts and put them in uh, as something like an LRFD framework, which makes it very easy to, to gain the benefits of the, the more detailed analyses without necessarily having to do much more detailed analyses. When we do it in terms of forces, we have relatively uh, good abilities to predict forces and moments and so our load resistance factors are, are, are not extreme, they're relatively close to one. When we move on to displacements, we have a lot higher um, uncertainties. Our ability to predict displacements is much more difficult to do. And so our demand and capacity factors reflect that. This approach, though, does give us the ability to do perform more complete and consistent seismic designs and seismic evaluations. So over uh, the geographic expanse of a country like Mexico or like the United States, where we have some areas that have much higher seismicity than others, we can design structures in these different locations to have the same level of, of risk. And our current procedures very often don't do that. So that's a root, it's an important opportunity for improvement. So thank you very much for your attention.